found out later that that Stephanie uh, Stephanie uh, got delivered from all of her depression and all that stuff just in the in the blink of an eye. It was uh, amazing and medication and everything was gone and it was really a uh, quite quite an emotional time for all of us and and uh, so it's just there's nothing better than to see people's lives restored. And that's why we do what we do also, you know. We, tonight, we don't know what's going to happen here. We're here for service. We don't know what's going to happen to all of us here. There, well, there might be a deliverance that's going to change the course of history for somebody. And so we gather together like this. There's always a chance that something major is going to happen. And that's what we live for. That's why we do what we do. And so um, tonight, Stephanie's an amazing teacher. Uh, she's She's got a very tremendous gift and I remember you know first time I, th I ever talked to her about preaching I said Stephanie I believe you're going to preach someday and she says yeah I'm going to she, she never argued with us she said yes I'm going to and so it was like a confirmation and, and it was really good and praise the Lord and ever since then we every time she comes up here things happen amen we learn something new right so let's stand to her feet and welcome Stephanie as she comes to, be, to share the word of God with us amen. It right this time. I always mess the mic up every time I come up here. Okay, just got my stuff ready. What was amazing was um, I missed Jordan last night. I was quite upset at that actually. Malachi needed to go to bed, so I won't. I go home, and Jordan comes in the door. This is my husband, Jordan. Now he comes in the door and he and he sits down, and I look at him and I say, "So what did Jordan preach about, Jordan Pomeranke?" And he's like. He's like, about the kingdom. And I just looked at him and smiled because, well, obviously God was in work because that's what I'm speaking of. <laughs> so I'm going to speak of something a little different, though. It's about um, kingdom culture. Um, you know, a lot of us, we always hear people talk about how we need to be this kingdom culture, right? But do we really know what that looks like? Do we really know our responsibilities as people in this culture, and that's what I'm going to talk about. We're going to look at Acts. Can you get me water, please? I just won't drink a lot, so I don't have to take a bathroom break. <laughs> I was a little worried at that. <laughs> so I'll be careful with the water. <laughs> so we, we think of the word culture. What a culture is, it's a group, it's groups of hundreds of people, right? They can they start out simple, but it, it ends up to be just hundreds and thousands of people with the same goals, the same expectations. Everybody in a culture, we all know our expectations, that's expected of us, you know, in your houses, what's expected of your lawn, like if you go in a town, our culture, that's a little culture, what's expected of us as residents. But in a kingdom culture, it's our character, that is what is expected of us. Okay? That's what I'm going to talk about tonight. And obviously, the beginning of the kingdom culture was Jesus. He started the kingdom culture. So that's where we're going we're gonna to look in Acts, because in Acts is when we see the disciples step into that kingdom culture. That's when we really see it. So, and I actually just named it just rip the page, my Bible. I named it Kingdom Mentality because a culture always starts with one person. So therefore, we, we can't look at other people and say, well, they're not doing it, so I don't have to be. We need to look at ourselves and say, what's my character? Where am I missing? Where, where do I need to change? And the Kingdom of God needs to be so entwined with our thinking and in our character that it is who we are from day to day. That we don't have to wake up and think, okay, who am I gonna be today? It's always the same person. We've got the same goals when we leave our house, and that is to show people who God is, his goodness and his greatness. So we're gonna look first at um, Acts 2, 1 to 13. I'll let that come up. So in the day of Pentecost, 
had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So we're going to back up here to verse 1. The Holy Spirit fell, not because they were just a group put together, but because they're in one accord. That's why the Holy Spirit came. That's so important in, the, in this verse. You know, a lot of times we just kind of skip because it said they come, they were called all one accord in one place. But one accord, they were in one heart. They had one goal. There was one reason why they were there. And that was to bring honor, to bring glory to God. That's why the Holy Spirit fell. And then the second part is in verse 3. It says, Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. So just... When I was reading this, I just kind of sat and tried to visualize this in my head. It says, divided tongues as a fire. So what I imagined was there's only about 120 people in this upper room. In the upper room, it's just a, like a meeting hall in the temple is where they are. It's about, only about 120 people. So what came to mind was like a big fireball kind of above them all, all these people. There's also this big fireball. And then it says, one sat upon each of them. So just imagine all of a sudden, like tiny fireballs shooting out of this and landing on each person. And in those fireballs was the, was the tongues that the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. And it says different tongues, divided tongues. They all didn't get the same thing. They were all different. And I think so often in, in um, just in life, we always see someone and we always think that we need to be like them, that we got to be, that's the person we got to be, right? But no, God made us who we are. You know, like for me, I've always kind of wanted to be a louder person because I'm very quiet and I I'm just don't speak that much. And I've... And sometimes I do wish that I was more of an extrovert, but that's not the way I was made. Different people are going to be drawn to me than to people who are that way. And that's just the way it is. And that's why there's divided tongues. is because not everyone is called to the same place. Not everyone's called to be the same. So if you go to verse 5. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred... The multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all of these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one in our own language in which we were born? And then I'm not going to try and say all the names. So we'll skip to 11. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said they're full of new wine. So here is where not just different tongues went to these people, but they were actually speaking different languages. Now at this time, we all know that Jesus was, was Hebrew. He spoke Hebrew, right? So the only people who understood his message when he came was those who spoke Hebrew. But at this time, what was happening is God was enabling all the nations, all the different languages around in Jerusalem, they were all able to hear the message of Jesus Christ. So it wasn't just the Hebrews specifically anymore. It was the whole nation was going to get this, was going to be able to understand the calling of Jesus Christ. And when I, when I read this, I instantly thought of that story of the Tower of Babel. And we're actually going to look at that. We're just going to skip, just skip over to Genesis 11, 1 to 9. It's just quick, so we'll just read it quickly. Now the whole earth, like at this time, so in Genesis 11, 
This is after the flood. So we've got Noah and his sons and their wives were on the big ark, okay? After the flood, Noah's sons created the nations. So they had, um, like it was, you know, different families filled with hundreds of people from these. And that's who we we're talking about is, is Noah's family is at the top and then it's all the different branches of the different families. So that's what they're talking about. Now the whole earth is that big family. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. So they all only spoke one language, every single person on earth. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, come let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come. Let us go down and confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there, over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad, over the face of the earth. So at the beginning of this we see it's, it's the big family, they're all living basically in the same part but they begin to build this huge tower they're gonna reach heaven and you could just imagine how huge this is like this is hundreds of thousands of people building this massive tower and God said here God says and this is what they begin to do now nothing that they propose propose to do will be withheld from them so obviously they were getting somewhere if God said, this has got to stop. So he went down, he says, let us go down. So he goes down with his angels and he scatters the people with the different languages. And that is when the nations, instead of being all in one, they all scattered. They had different languages so they couldn't understand each other. So that's when one language went over to one area, one traveled away. And that's how you kind of get the big picture of the earth now where everybody's all over the place is because of the languages. So when you skip back to Acts, what God's doing is those languages, he's giving them all new purpose. All those people, not just the Hebrews, he's giving everybody a new, pur a new purpose, a new way of life, that new kingdom living. He's enabling everybody to be able to hear the gospel. And that's kind of where you get, you know, different people. They were given different languages because they're called to different places. So remember, it only started with 120 people in the upper room. All different languages because they're all called to go out and spread. Not stay in one area, but to spread the word. And that's kind of, you know, when you think of our town, you, you think of it as not maybe languages, but as our jobs. You know, we all have our different jobs. We don't all work in the exact same spot and there's a reason because we're, we're called to different people. We're called to preach to different people. Some of us are called to like me, you know, to retail. Some of us are called to work with the people in construction. Some people are called to work in the banks because we're called to different people so we, have, we are called to be in different places. So we'll skip to Acts 2 verse 14. I'm not going to read this whole part. I'm just going to kind of go over it because it's, it's rather long. This is where we see Peter. The Holy Spirit has fallen on all the people. And what's happening is all of a sudden everybody's coming around. They're like, oh my goodness, what's happening? Now there's thousands of people that are encircling the upper room, encircling the 120 people wanting to know what is going on. They're hearing something new. 
So there's thousands of people being drawn. They're in Jerusalem. This is a huge place. And these people are all coming and drawn to here. And we see Peter. Peter is, this is the same Peter who only about 50 days earlier, at 50 days earlier is when Jesus was resurrected. So only about 50 days earlier did Peter deny Jesus. This is the same man. He was so afraid of what the people were going to think, what the people were going to say about him, that when he was asked if he had any affiliation with Jesus, he said no, he didn't. Three times he did that, right? But here we see the Holy Spirit has fallen and he has made a decision that he is not going to let that pass him by and he will not deny Jesus. And he stands up with boldness and he starts declaring to these people, not only was he preaching Jesus' name, but he was telling the people what they did wrong by crucifying Jesus. It was kind of like a big slap in the face, really is what he was doing. But he was explaining what had happened and, and the Holy Spirit just came and just fell. So we see this boldness that just comes upon him and the only reason why the boldness came upon him is because of that Holy Spirit. But he also made the decision to walk into that calling of his. Whereas before he was so frightened but here we see he just steps into it. And a lot of times we think, well, they're, you know, I'm not ready. This was 50 days. Sometimes we wait years to step in our calling because we think we're not ready. But that's not what happened here. As Peter just said, I'm going to go for it. So we have a choice to step into our callings and into our giftings that we're given. Instead of let those things pass us by. So we'll look a little further into Acts. So I guess I actually have points, but I never said them. I'll find point one for you. <laughs> um, I don't know. Point one was if we have the Holy Spirit dwelling and working through us, then people are going to be drawn to us. And that was like when the Holy Spirit fell in the upper room and all those people were drawn. So if we have that same Holy Spirit, then people are going to be drawn to us. They're going to be drawn to our personality. They're going to be drawn to just the, the way we live our life, just the simplicity of, of it. They're going to be drawn to that. Point number two was that the Holy Spirit enables us to stand boldly. boldly. We just have to step into that. So Acts 2, 46 and 47. So continually, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So there we see that same with one accord. So not only did they the Holy Spirit fell in the church, but instead of walking out and going home and just collapsing on the couch and saying, okay, I'm going to get my rest, tomorrow we'll do it again. They went home, still in one accord, breaking bread from house to house in that same state of mind. They never left it. They had that taste and they just kept going with it. They wanted the more and more, so they stayed in one accord. They didn't just break off into, in different parts. Every meal was a celebration. They ate with gladness and simplicity of heart. So they never ate their food worrying if they were going to have a meal tomorrow or what ate their food and we were talking about what, what's going to happen tomorrow. They ate, enjoyed it, and praised God as they ate. And sometimes we think... No, we wait to praise God for big things. But, you know, Jordan and I have really learned that lesson. That, you know, sometimes food is not always available. And you praise God for what you have today and he will make it available the next time you need to eat. You know, we've really learned that lesson that 
um, you know, when we f when uh, we first got married there, the first few months, um, we would go probably a couple of days without food in the, in the house, and we were like, hey, seriously, we have two days till payday, and we got no food to eat, and then we kind of got this mentality, okay. Um, I remember Pastor actually said it, that we just got to thank God for what we have today and he'll provide for tomorrow. And that's exactly what we started doing and to this day we still do. Every time we eat, we just thank God, thank you for the food that's on the table now. And we've never had that happen again to us where we've missed, had to miss a meal because we didn't have any money to go buy food. So it really works. It really does to just thank God for the littlest of things. Having enough gas to get to work and back. Right? Like Jordan's testimony yesterday with us. Having enough money to go to Mushjin back. And we just, and we gave it. We gave it in an offering because we just felt we had to. And God provided for us. We were able to pay off more than we thought we could. And that's just, that's, the incredibleness of God, what just praising him for every little thing does, right? Is it just opens your heart to receive more, just being happy with what you have. And point number three there is just to live a life of thanksgiving and praise. That the simplest of blessings should bring praise on our lips. Just the simplest of things. So we'll go to Acts 3. Verses 1 to 10. And this is the lame man who gets healed. So we, can't, we know, we've heard this story lots of times. It's the lame man, he's sitting at the gate called Beautiful, and he's, he's begging for alms. And Peter and John are, are walking to the temple to go to pray, to seek God's word. And I want to skip to verse 5. It says, So he gave them his attention. So this is Peter and John are, he, they looked at him and they said, look at us. And he, so they gave him, gave them his attention. And it says he's expecting to receive something from them. So he's sitting at the gate of the temple expecting something. It doesn't say he's expecting alms. He's expecting money. It says he's expecting something. He's expecting to receive and that's, that's where our hearts need to be. You know, if when we're faithful to God, he's faithful to us, so we can expect him to be faithful. We don't have to make a tantrum and, and beg him. If we're faithful, he is faithful. And they say, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. They didn't have what he expected to get. He was, you know, he was ready to receive, but he probably never realized that they were going to give him the name of Jesus, right? And he was going to stand up and walk. He probably never went, he would, you know, he was at an age where they didn't believe miracles were ever going to happen for him. He was going to spend the rest of his life here. And they came and simply touched him and said, in the name of Jesus, walk. And he got up, leaping, Walking, leaping, and praising God. He continually praised God for that. For the name of Jesus that he got. So this is a result of how the Holy Spirit works through us. It gives us something to give to others is the name of Jesus. When we got the Holy Spirit, we have something to give because we have something in us. If we don't have him, we really don't have much to give people because there's only so much money you can give people. But the name of Jesus can do way more, farther, go farther, do more than we ever imagined. So number four is that we should be filled with joy whenever God moves, giving testimony to his goodness in all things. Then we hear after that Peter and John were, were imprisoned for doing this, for saying the name of Jesus. We should never be embarrassed to speak his name. We should never be embarrassed to tell people what he's doing in our lives, in our church, in the lives of our friends. We should always be ready 
to give testimony of his good works. We need the Holy Spirit and his renewing of our minds to use us to share in boldness and in authority. And one of the things is, actually we'll just read it. Go to Acts 4.18. Oh, sorry, verse 31. It says, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the, the word of God with boldness. So sometimes we think that um, one filling of the Holy Spirit is enough. But here we find out that it's not. This was their second filling of the Holy Spirit. They didn't just receive one and they were good for months. This was only a couple days later. They got together and prayed and received a second filling of the Holy Spirit. So this is where you find out that, you know, one time is not enough. It's a continual event. We need the Holy Spirit filling every day of our lives. We need to be fervent in our prayers. And that's point five. We need to be continually seeking a filling of the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't have to be just a church. We can do it at home. It's in, through prayer, through worship, through um, reading his word. We should never be satisfied with the level we're at, but strive in prayer for more. More of the Holy Spirit. The, the filling of the Holy Spirit, it renews our minds. And the words renew actually means revive. And that's what we need if we're going to walk into a, a kingdom culture is we need re a renewed mind every day to, to go out to our work, to really work um, in the way God wants us to is we need to have a renewed mind. Yeah. We'll not live the life Jesus died to give us until we hold on to... Unless we hold, sorry, let me start again. We will not live the life Jesus died to give us if we hold on to the old, traditional, carnal, or negative ways of thinking. We have to change our ways of thinking, and that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. The Holy, we ask for that filling of the Holy Spirit, and he changes our thinking. He changes our character to be more Christ-like. And that's what we're called to be. It's Mark 16, 17. It says, and these signs will follow those who believe. So if you believe, then the signs, those wonders are going to follow you. If we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we believe, right? <coughs> we don't get filled with the Holy Spirit just for us. Right? Initially, it's for us to renew our mind. But we come to a maturity in our relationship with God when it's not for us. We get filled so that we can walk out the doors and we have something to give to those who come in contact with us. And unless we're filled with the Holy Spirit, unless we get poured into, we have nothing to pour out to other people around us. In John 10.10, 10, it says... I've come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. And the life he's talking about, the Greek word's actually, it's, uh, it's called zoe. It's, I don't know if that's the right pronunciation, but it's just zoe. And it means, li it means the Greek word for life is what he's talking about here. And it's not just our day-to-day -day life. He's talking about abundance in our finances, it's abundant life. It's a God-type life is what the definition says. It's a God-type life is what he's talking here. Filled with the renewing of our minds. It's filled with the Holy Spirit. It's filled with his presence as we walk out the door. Um, I have this uh, Bible at home. It's called the Message Remix. And there's one verse in there. It didn't really match up with my New King James, but it said something that um, was, it kind of really opened my eyes. It's in Ephesians 1.23, I think. It's kind of a... Their verses are weird in that Bible. 
It says, the church you see is not peripheral to the world, but the world is peripheral to the church. And peripheral means controlled by or influenced. So the church is not to be influenced or controlled by the, ch- by the world, but the world is to be influenced by the church. And that's the kingdom culture we're talking about. It's until we step into that kingdom culture, we're not going to influence people. And that's where we need to be. The church is meant to be higher. I started these courses with... Um, Faith Alive a while ago, and after I wrote this about the Renewing the Mind part, I got this book in the mail, and it's called Renewing the Mind. So, was, and I was reading it this morning, and there's actually a part I'm going to share, because it's really good. I'm just going to read it. And it's about, it's about the kingdom culture. It's about how the church is supposed to look like what we're supposed to look like. So it says, yes, we believe the Lord is coming back, but we've got to wake up. He's not coming back for a poor, sick church who's waiting to escape the world's mess. No, he's coming back for a glorious church. The glorious church that Ephesians 5 talks about. When we're shining in his glory, the world will look at us and say, how do you do it? How do you have that kind of marriage? How do you raise those kinds of kids? How do you live that kind of life? So we will tell them, you've got to get in the glorious church. Well, what kind of church is that, they will ask. I thought churches sang old songs. thought preachers just got up there and talked a bunch of rubbish that didn't make a difference in everyday life. I thought you just needed a crutch to make it through life while you waited for Jesus to rescue you off the planet. Well, you were wrong, we will say. We're changing the planet, not escaping anything. The devil's hoping he can get raptured because we're beating the hell out of him. We aren't leaving. The earth was given to the saints. We aren't leaving until we possess it. We aren't leaving until we subdue this planet. We aren't leaving until we take dominion over this planet. Abundant life will rally the church toward battle, not away from it. We're not to be like Jonah trying to run out of town and get away from Nineveh, the city God sent him to. No, we're called to march right into the middle of Nineveh with signs and wonders following the preaching of the glorious abundant message Jesus died to bring. The church is called to take dominion over the devil's works in Jesus' name. And we can and will do this as we allow our minds to be changed. To be changed, to be renewed into into what into his works into his message All right so we need to continually be always just renewing our minds and be filling with the holy spirit not just once but continually so the worship team can actually come up it was very short but i hope you got something um, So, guess what? What we're what I'm going to do tonight is let's call out for another filling of the Holy Spirit. For the rest of these two weeks, you know, let's really dig in and and ask ourselves, you know, what is this kingdom? Where's our kingdom mentality? Let's dig in for a, a filling that's going to last, not just be thing that we walk out the door, but that's going to last for the next two weeks, that's going to last farther than that. Let's just really, really dig into to worshiping and, and having that life of praise tonight.